For the motor mounts, use impedance methods to find the frequency response of the chassis force with regard to input force. So we have a motor that's mounted on some mount. So say it's like a rubberized mount or something. Um, and it's connected to a chassis. So maybe this is a, an automotive, uh, an engine or something like that that's um, uh, connected to a chassis. Uh, whatever it is, we already drew a schematic of it, so I didn't make you guys interpret it too much. But this is actually a pretty common mechanical engineering problem because you have some sort of motor or engine that's connected to a chassis and the engine's going to create a lot of vibrations that are going to go through to the chassis. And we want to analyze them. We might want to design the mount so that those vibrations are minimized. Okay? So this is a classic sort of frequency response problem. Okay? And we're going to approach it by... First off, finding the um, linear graph model, but then we're going to find a transfer function that relates the input force, which is what we're modeling the the um, the motor's vibrations as as a force that's going into the structure, uh, going into the mount, which goes into the structure, and we want to know what force is applied to the chassis. Okay, so if there's a force that the motor is, you know, uh, creating by its vibrations onto the mount, that mount's going to apply forces onto the chassis, and we want to know how much of that force gets transmitted at different frequencies. Okay, so like low frequency stuff, how does it pass through? High frequency stuff, how does it pass through to the to the chassis? So this is like classic engineer mechanical engineering analysis right here. Vibration sort of analysis. And this is the type of thing you'll talk about in a vibrations class too. But you'll be so prepared for it because you'll already have all of this background. So you take vibrations next year. I don't teach that. Well, I haven't taught it. Uh, Duan teaches it. Uh, the chair? The ME chair? Sean Duan. Yeah. So yeah, he, he typically teaches it. Although... You know, who knows? Maybe I'll teach it next year. I just never know. No, I probably won't because I'm locked in on so many classes that I have to teach. So. Anyways. Uh, so the, the little schematic here, we need to draw a linear graph from it. It's the first step. So let's do that. Uh, we'll just make chassis. Since we drew it as ground here, we'll just draw it as ground again. Um, which makes sense. We're saying it's not moving. You know, that might be a good assumption if you have a relatively large chassis. Um, probably isn't going to move much, but it still might transmit forces. And that's what we want to know about. So the uh, the mass node definitely that's going to be something, right? So mass always references ground. And we have um, a force source that's going into the mass, right? And we need to draw ourselves a what kind of arrow? Coordinate, Coordinate arrow. Let's draw it down because it's the direction of our force source. So then we can... I always remember that if we did that, then we can draw this arrow up. That's how I remember the sign convention. Um, and that's our FS. And then our two other elements, our spring and our damper. Are there any other nodes in this graph? No, no right? Because this is the only other distinct velocity. So there's the reference velocity and there's the mass velocity. Those are the only two velocities. So we're going to just be going to ground um, with our K and our B. We don't like that B. I want to do that again. That's a little better. So that's our 
linear graph. So we could, uh, so our general strategy, um, we could apply a through variable divider rule like immediately to this thing, right? This thing is like uh, primed and ready for a through variable divider rule. However, however, we're going to do the general strategy as a demonstration, just so that you guys can see it. Because I've done the very the div divider rules like three examples of those, so I want to do one that's not that. So we know that's just the like that's when you use the uh, admittances y two over y one y two y yeah okay. yeah. So I could I uh, we could do it both ways. Let's do it the let's do it the general way first, and then we'll do we'll sketch out what we would do for the. Uh, two variable divider. Yeah. Do you have another one of these? Ah, oh, is there, are there any extras? Yeah, there's extras. Here. Okay, so, um, well, so we'll come back to that at the end. Maybe we'll we'll do the little two variable divider at the end. Uh, okay, good. Now, oh, question. We want to know what the force is on the chassis as the output, right? What is that? If you look at this, is it the what is the force on the chassis? Yeah. So so our output is actually FK plus FB. Ah, a little different. A little different. Okay, something a little different. That's good. So that's something to note. And when we do our through variable divider rule, that means that we're going to want to combine those two elements together because we actually want the sum of the two. So we want all of the force going through the combination of those two elements. But for now, we're just going to leave them and we're just going to do our our uh, general method. So the general method, I've, I outlined it in uh, some notes before, um, but I mean one thing we could do to start is to write out the impedance of each of these elements. So what is the impedance of the spring? Over. S over K. Uh, what is the impedance of the damper? That's one over b. That one, I that one really always trips people up. It's so funny. Uh, I, I mean, it's not really funny. I'm not like laughing at you guys. Sorry, <laughs> not meaning to be rude. Yeah, I think that that's it. I think that it's like it's the inverse that you, like, you lose your intuition there. Um, and then the mass is remember. Yeah, 1 over ms. Good. Okay, so those are our impedances. The elemental equations, so the general strategy was write the elemental equations and then write out your typical algebraic relationships that you know, your continuity, compatibility equations, and then do the algebra. This is actually it's the same method we use to find the state equations, right? Uh, but we're not going to have any differential equations since we're using impedances. And all the elemental equations are going to be just generalized Ohm's law, right? It's just Vm equals the impedance of element m times the through variable for element m, which is the force. So I'm going to label these equations. This is equation 1. Then we have uh, the velocity across the spring, Vk, is equal to Zk times Fk. This almost gets boring, doesn't it? It's just writing the same formula for each of these elements. This is 2. And then finally we have Vb is equal to Zb Fb. And this is, L this is equation three. So those are our elemental equations. We wrote one for each passive element. We have m, k, and b. 
So M, K, and B are our three elemental equations, and they're all just generalized Ohm's law with an impedance in there. So we knew that was coming, um, but we had to wait for it to actually happen before we realized how boring it was. So now the continuity equations we want to tackle. Um, We, we should, if we're going to uh, write continuity and compatibility equations, and we want to write down the minimal set of them, we should go ahead and make a normal tree, right? So there's only one thing in the normal tree. It's the A size. Very good. So, okay, so our continuity equation requires that we write, we draw a contour that intersects this passive element and only that passive element once, right? So that contour, we could do this one. That would be a contour. And that pretty much says that all the force going in is equal to these three forces, right? Um, or, or we could write that Fm, which is what we're supposed to write on the left-hand side, F is equal to Fs minus Fk minus Fb. Okay, so it's Fm is equal to Fs minus Fk minus Fb. So there's our fourth equation, and that's the only continuity equation we need. Compatibility equations, how many of those are we going to have? Maybe two, because we've got two passive elements not in the normal tree. So we're going to put each of them in there. And what are they? They're very trivial in this case. What do they say? Because we be yeah they're all just equal to each other, yeah which is great. So we just can say that uh, v k equals v m, which is our fifth equation, and we can say that v b is also is equal to v m, which is our sixth equation. All right. Now it's just algebra. We want the transfer functions fk over fs and fb over fs. Uh, we really want the sum fk plus fb over fs, but notice if we had this one and we had this one, we could just add the two together and we would get the sum the fk plus fb over fs. So uh, we, we know that we can solve for fk and fb from the continuity, compatibility, and elemental equations. And so this is just a system of linear algebraic equations. And you guys have been solving these forever, right? These are just like old hat. So I'm going to write them down in, I, I think I did descending order, hopefully. One, let's see. Oh, oops. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to write the equations across. So I'm going to set this up as a matrix to solve it because that's just the only way to go when you get to very big ones. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've got uh, the first equation says that Vm equals Zm plus, uh, times Fm. Now, what we want to do is we want to put in this vector here, we want to put all of our unknown variables, which there are six of them. We have six equations and six unknowns. And so they're going to be the state variables and the, um, uh, well, in general, it's going to be the, um, the primary and secondary variables altogether. So we have six of them total. Let's write them down. So put them in this column. Vm, Fm, Vk, 
fk vb and fb okay you arbitrarily picked the order of those uh it's it's arbitrary yeah i mean you just got to choose something so i just chose to go it's nice to choose a pattern <laughs> Like VM, FM, VK, FK, VB, FB. But you can choose any order that you like. So then you just need to fill in each row as a, an equation. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, uh, the first equation says that VM minus we, all of the terms that have a... Uh, one of these unknown variables in it should come to the left side, okay, since we have them in this column. So VM minus ZM FM equals zero. That's this first equation. I'll rewrite the first one just so that we have it very explicitly. You can rewrite all of them, but it gets a little tedious. VM minus ZM FM equals zero. So we're going to just transcribe this into the, into the matrix, okay? And that's just going to be the first row here. We're going to say VM. So there is a VM. So we'll just put a 1 there. So 1. And then FM is the next term. So we need to put a, a what, what is the coefficient? Negative ZM. Very good. And then we have nothing else from these variables, right? So there are going to be four zeros, one, two, three, four, and that's going to equal zero. So there's our first equation. The second equation is very, very similar, right? We have, so this is VK, so zero VM, zero FM. Do we have a VK? A one. And then do we have an FK? Yeah. Yeah. What's the coefficient? Negative ZK. That's right, because we were moving it to the left-hand side of the equation. And there's nothing else on the left-hand side. And that's equal to? Zero. Zero. Awesome. So now we've picked up speed. So let's see. Three, no VM, no FM, no VK, no FK. 1 VB, right? And negative ZB times FB. And that's all equal to? Zero. Zero. So this is part of why I choose a sort of pattern to these variables, because it creates a sort of pattern in the matrix, and you can recognize if you made a mistake a little easier that way. So that's a nice pattern that emerged. Now, these, these later equations, so we did the first three, they were all the elemental equations. Now we have the one continuity and two compatibility equations, so they're going to be a little different. Continuity equation, um, we solved it for FM as we usually do to help algebraically do things, but in this case, we're going to actually move all of the variables to the left-hand side except for FS. Our source we can't express in this matrix vector multiplication, can we? So it has to be on the right-hand side. Everything else comes to the left-hand side, though. We have 0 VM. How many FM? One. One. 0 VK. How many FK? One. One. 0 VB. How many FB? One. One. And then what is that whole expression equal to? Yes. FS. Very good. All right, now, the fifth one is that VK is equal to VM, which is pretty trivial. We move everything to the left-hand side, and it just says VK minus VM equals zero. So, one, zero, negative one, zero, zero. Uh, it's because you got to move... Oh, actually, it doesn't matter which one is negative, right? Yeah, so I've, I moved, I moved uh, VK over to this side. 
um, you could have moved VM over to the other side, in which case the sign would change, which is fine. Either one. Uh, it's because it's all equal to zero, um, it's arbitrary, and you could multiply. Remember your reduced row echelon form? You could multiply any row by anything, scale it. Oh, those good old days. Last <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so the last equation is 6, just VB and VM. So I'm going to say VM is 1 and 0, 0, 0, uh, negative 1, 0, 0. Right? Whew. Okay. So now we have our system all set up. I mean, we had the system set up before, but now we just wrote it in a matrix form. So now we could use reduced row echelon form, etc. Yeah. So just trying to follow through the example, what we've been looking at in 13.6, they just use the continuity and compatibility equations. Is that just through interpretation? Because it looks like what they did is they plugged in your elemental into the continuity and compatibility and just made a system. So yeah. So, I mean, Six. we could so do that, right? We could just, we could eliminate, it's a little bit faster, when you do, you know, have to do a three by three instead of a six by six. So you could eliminate all the secondary variables by just inserting them, writing them this way, inserting them in here, and eliminating three of your six variables. So this is a way of truncating it. It's, yeah, this is a way of truncating it. I mean, you could either do that beforehand by hand, or you could just solve this one. I mean, it. You could. Do, I mean, you're essentially doing the full problem, but you're doing it very targetedly. It just seems like less room for error. Yeah, I mean, this one is like kind of the brute force, like just do it. Um, and there's always, I mean, what's nice about this continuity compatibility equations is we construct them so that we can insert and eliminate a variable with one substitution, which is really nice. So taking advantage of that is totally fine um, if you want to take advantage of that. It's once again, it's sort of six or half a dozen. I'm just, I'm just teaching it this way, just as, because I think conceptually this is a little bit easier, but actually doing the calculation by hand, um, definitely use that trick where you substitute the continuity compatibility equations in and eliminate three of your variables right off the bat. But I'm not expecting you guys to be doing large ones of these by hand. If you haven't noticed, I'm really pushing, I'm really plugging the the um, cross variable and through variable divider rules and I expect on an exam I'm going to give you guys something that you can apply those to and you can get a transfer function like immediately. This is so trivial to get a transfer function using those rules compared to going through this whole process so I'm definitely recommending unless you get really good with this method which is totally fine you can get good with it um, then you have to do the algebra. The algebra just gets really messy if you do it this way. So, all right. So, I don't expect you guys to solve something that's by hand. I mean, you can, and it's really not bad. There's a lot of zeros, right? So you can eliminate things in this pretty easily, and you guys are in linear algebra right now. Sounds like you guys are doing that. I feel like you guys, don't you guys do that in, like, pre-calculus, though? Like... Solving like matrix inverse problems, really? Yeah, in high school. We are failing you guys. Okay. Uh, anyways, don't worry about it. We know them now, so. Let's pull up Mathematica. We could use, I mean, I, we could do this manually, but I don't want to get bogged down in this, in this part. Uh, so, oh. What's the difference So, they do a lot of the same things. However, uh, Mathematica is, I think, way better for symbolic stuff. Uh, that's... That's what I would say, and I think that MATLAB is better for doing specific things, especially when it comes to, it used to be like the wisdom was numerical stuff doing MATLAB, but Mathematica is getting pretty good at that. Um, 
I would say that MATLAB has a big advantage in one area that I use it, and I think that there are some other ones as well. That's so they have the controls toolbox, and that toolbox is really great. And there's really just nothing else out there that can do it. Mathematica has one now, it's just not as good, and Python now has one, but it's not as good. So I'm hopeful that some like Python open source one will come uh, along. Maybe I should help contribute to it. There's no time for that stuff. Uh, but in Mathematica, when you have something that's that's uh, symbolic, definitely Mathematica is way easier. It's like built to do symbolics. MATLAB is like an afterthought, the symbolics part. So, um, okay. I'm going to define my impedance list. So this is something you could like, you could automate this, right? You could totally automate this this whole process, but uh, I'm do, putting putting them in manually. So first, you define the impedances, and I'm defining this as a list, okay? And this is online, this notebook, so you can download it and play with it. But I'm defining a list. That's what these braces do, and it has the impedance of m, zk, zb, and I'm not defining the symbols. I could come up here and I'm going to do like z dumb because I don't want to actually define one of them. I could say z dumb is equal to 1 over m times s, okay? And then wherever I, if I said like what is 3 times z dumb, it would plug it in, which is cool, but I don't like defining the variable if I don't have to. So instead, I use this substitution rule list. So then whenever I have an expression, like if I had 3 times zm, it'll leave it as 3 times zm until I apply the substitution list, which is easy to do with this, with this uh, notation here, slash dot, and then you put the list of replacement rules. And then it replaces it. But it still doesn't define ZM. So you could have some expressions that have ZM in them that don't get evaluated, and some that have ZM with the substitutions in there. And you get to control that. So that's why I use this. So this is sort of an idiom that I use. Um, I learned it from someone, and I think it's great. So there you go. You've got this impedance list, and so we can use that to substitute in when we want to for all the impedances. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to work with these. We're going to write down out our our matrices. So, oops. So we've got we've got this, and so I, I saw I say solve it. I mean, one one thing you could do is say, oh, okay. Well, v two. This vector is equal to. Oh, sorry. Not v2, v1. We want to solve for v1, right? v1, all of our unknowns, is equal to p inverse times v2. Right? We just took the inverse of p. I mean, this, this whole formula is p v1 equals v2. So we just took the inverse of p and moved it to the left hand side. So that's pretty straightforward. So in Mathematica we can actually do this easily. Um, if you reduce row echelon form, all that stuff is just a way of solving this. So I'm going to define the P matrix. I just plugged in our Z's and our 1's and our zeros. Um, and in Mathematica you define a matrix by defining a list of lists. So the outer list, and then each row is one of the inner lists. So there's no like rows and columns like there are in MATLAB. It's just lists of lists. But I I wrote it like this so that it gave you the feeling of it being a matrix, right? And then our vector to make it a sort of column vector, it's a little bit hinky in Mathematica, but uh, you just make a list of lists of one element, and it it's essentially the same as having a column vector. All right, and all of these like line breaks, that's arbitrary. Like I just put those in there for visual, uh, visually understanding it. So I define those. So if I was to evaluate p, 
it's just this list of lists. It's just this matrix. I can print it in matrix form if I plug it into this function, which gives me a nice looking matrix. Okay. So then solve for the variables. V1 is equal to inverse of P, and then matrix multiplication in Mathematica is a dot. Okay? You just put a dot in between them. So, and then I'm replacing all of the previous expression, all of the um, impedances from above. So this is equivalent to that slash dot notation. I'm just using the full like replace all. Slash dot is just like a, a shorthand for replace all. Okay. And then I'm telling it to simplify. And then I'm telling it to print it out in matrix form. And that's this. So I'll make this bigger so you guys can see these a little bit better. Um, size. Boom. So what we have here is a solution for each of our variables. So we've got vm, fm, vk, fk, vb, fb. And notice that they're all equal to something times fs. Right? So fs is in all of them. We could just divide both sides of this by fs and we would have the transfer function from each of these. Yeah, so that's where the transfer function comes from. So you get the transfer function from fs to each of these variables, to each of the variables that we didn't know. So now we just solve for all the transfer functions. This is literally like all of them. So if, if you divide this by fs before you print it out, whoops. Well, that was not what I wanted. If you divide this by fs, which would make it the transfer function for each of these, that just takes out the fs of each one, and we've got the transfer function. So, cool! So that's the general way how to do this. I mean, this is, this is how you get all of the transfer functions that you want. You get transfer functions you don't even need. You get extras. You could be like, here, I don't even need this transfer function. You can have it. All your friends can have one. Okay. Now, what we want, remember, is the transfer function. I'll switch back to here. We want the transfer function from fs to the sum of fk plus fb, right? So this little insight is important. Uh, I mentioned it in words earlier, but if you have fk over fs, which is something we have, right? And you add it to fb over fs, which is also something we have, then the, new, the denominators are the same, so we have fk plus fb over fs, which is the transfer function we're looking for. Nerd reference. Ah, okay. So, uh, which one is it? So there's, so there's a question. So, so first off, we need two of them. We need to add them together. So which two do we need? Yeah, the fourth one and the sixth one. So if we go back here, our fk and our fb are the fourth and the sixth of our v1 elements. So we need the fourth and the sixth of this. So... You know that fk is the fourth and fb is the sixth, so adding them gives the total motor mount force. So that's, this is how you take an element out of a, a, um, an array in Mathematica, is double braces, um, double brackets. And then I, also this little simplified thing that I throw in there is so nice, because if I don't do that, it looks like that. Uh, which actually, the denominator is the same, so it's easy, but 
who wants to do that by hand, or who wants to even think about it? Let's just use Mathematica. Yeah. You do? Okay. I just, I, you know, I just want to make sure you're getting, you know, everything that you want, Jordan. So, here's our transfer function. Um, we can just write it down. So, <laughs> from Mathematica, we know that fk plus fb over fs equals, so the numerator was bs plus k, the denominator, it was factored out this s, but I'm going to distribute the s and rearrange. The denominator is m s squared plus b s plus k. Okay? And um, if we want to put this in standard form, this first coefficient is 1, right, in the denominator polynomial. Uh, so we have everything is divided by m, so it looks more ugly. b over m s plus k over m divided by s squared, that's the only one that looks better, plus b over m s plus k over m. One. That's right. That's, that's the standard form of transfer function, which, I mean, th this is totally the transfer function, but this is the form that we think of as the standard form. And it helps us. We're going to look at the damping ratio and the natural frequency. Um, so that it'll help us with that. So I wanted to know what the frequency response was. So I want to know what the frequency response function is. Okay. Now, the frequency response function is defined as just being h. So let's call this h. We didn't call it h. Let's call it h. Yeah, h of s. Um, the frequency response function is h of j omega, right? Which is just going to be h of s evaluated at s equals j omega. Just from the definition. Or actually not from the definition, but we derive that this is true. Okay? So all we need to do is just plug in s equals j omega. So, let's use this form, because this one's messy. Let's use this one. Um, so let's plug in uh, j omega. So the real part of the numerator is going to be k plus, and now this, this whole term is imaginary, so we'll move it over, plus j omega b, right? And the denominator has a real and an imaginary part as well. Let's see if we can figure out. So the real part's going to definitely have this k in it, right? k. This j omega gets squared. So... Right, negative m omega squared, right? So this is all the this is the real part. I don't really need to put parentheses around it, but I did just to be just to be um, explicit or clear. Parental advisor. So plus b s. We plug in s equals j omega. We get plus j omega b again. And this is the imaginary part. So numerator has real and imaginary. Denominator has real and imaginary. Okay, uh, rationalize it. I just went through and multiplied, so this has a, a real and imaginary part in the denominator, so I just multiplied by the complex conjugate, and I just wrote it out because I feel like it just took too long to go through the stupid algebra, but it's pretty trivial. So this is it. So uh, next 
uh, time we meet on Monday, we're going to, and I'm not even going to do a lecture over the weekend. What do you know? Uh, I, uh, on Monday, we're going to learn how to plot this. Okay, so the frequency response function, we talked about it and how important it is, and the magnitude and the phase are so important. But on Monday, we're going to learn how to plot them in the standard way, boda plots. But before, before we finish today, uh, I want to find the natural frequency and damping ratio, because it's a vibration problem. These are really important aspects of, of this problem. So, the standard form of the denominator of the second order transfer function is s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. Now, you can use that, like we have before, just comparing coefficients, we can come up with two algebraic equations that allow us to solve for what zeta and omega n are. The natural frequency and the damping ratio. So, this implies that omega n is equal to what? Looking up at this term here. So omega n squared has to be equal to k over m, right? So omega n has to equal the square root of k over m. Taking, we always take the positive side. Square root of k over m. And this is this identity here is found from saying that this coefficient, b over m, has to be equal to 2 zeta omega n, right? So if you create this equality and you solve, we know omega n now, so if you solve for zeta, you get that zeta is equal to, just rearranging, we have b over 2 m omega n, if you plug in omega n from above, you get b over, so and doing a little bit of simplifying, b over 2 square root of k m. Okay. So, we have a minute left. Let's talk about how you would do this with, with impedances, okay? Or excuse me, I'm doing this with the through variable divider rule. So I'm just going to come up here and copy this down. Okay. And I'm going to say, okay, we want the sum of these two through variables together. So we can easily just combine them into a single impedance. Um, or I, we don't even have to, uh, but we just have to do two of these. So either one. Look, I, I'm going to combine them. Let's combine them and let's make this into uh, ZE. So I say ZE is equal to ZK, ZB, since they're in parallel, divided by ZK plus ZB. Right? I'll make this blue. Um, so let's say you plug that in and you got you got those things. Now you have yourself a perfect through variable divider that's set up. You have a through variable source, and in parallel you have other elements. And you care about the through variable of this combined element, ZE. So you can write the transfer function. F, um, I'll call it uh, F K B because it's the combined one. F K B divided by F S. This transfer function. Let's go back. What is our our what does our formula say? It says it talks about it in terms of admittances, right? So I'll write it in terms of admittances. The y that you want over the otherwise. So y K B divided by y k b plus y m. Now, y k b uh, is just equal to 1 over z e, right? By definition. And 
y uh, kb again is 1 over ze plus ym, which is just 1 over zm. And so we could simplify this to be, um, since we're combining two, it's sort of like that, that old rule that we're familiar with. We'll multiply the numerator and denominator by uh, ze and by zm. So we end up with zm in the numerator divided by uh, zm plus ze. Question. Yeah. You were just looking for the force, the free variable off of B. You couldn't combine B and K, right? Correct. Okay. So I'm gonna set that in yeah. So if you just wanted the force in the damper or the force in the spring, you couldn't combine them. But you, it wouldn't matter because you still, they're all in parallel. Yeah, so just use the same equation, but you can't combine them. Okay. Uh, you can't get rid of the variable you're interested in. Unless they were in series, then you couldn't add them. Right, so if you had this, so I think it's maybe part D of one of your homework problems. You can use the through variable divider rule, but there's like, there's a series, uh, there's something in series here on the last element, and you want the through variable. So you can add them together. That's totally fine. Yeah, so there's like, I would say there are probably like three or four tricks in the bag. You know, you can do the Thevenin equivalent or an equivalent. You can do, um, you can combine the elements together. You can change it from a through variable to an across variable by using just the impedance. You can do all of these things. There's like sort of a handful of tricks. And then you can use them in any combination. So it's sort of like the possibilities kind of explode, but there are only a handful of tricks. And... Notice how this was really easy. I mean, you just have to plug in what these impedances are, and you have the expression. So this method of using the through variable across the variable divider is so powerful. I definitely recommend using it. Um, but it is good to know that you can always fall back on just doing the algebra problem. And truly, we don't even need to turn it into a matrix problem because you can just try to wade into the algebra manually, right? We all know how to do that. We've all done it. We've all waded into the algebra. We know we can get rid of half of the variables off the top all the time. Half of them are going to be continuity and compatibility equations. We can eliminate the secondary variables immediately. So if you feel like wading into the rest of the algebra, Go for it. Um, you can just use elimination or whatever, but that's essentially the same as putting it in the matrix form and using Gaussian elimination in the matrix. So once again, I say to you, it's six or half a dozen. But the one, you know, these uh, these divider rule tricks are powerful and can let you get to the shortcut to the answer a lot quicker than going through the full full thing. So. I think that we have now closed the book on how to find transfer functions. And, and now you guys come talk to me if you have more issues, of course. But I'm not going to be lecturing on it anymore. I think we can move on to just the uh, uh, um, yeah frequency response stuff. Apparently, I hit six minutes after the, the class is supposed to be over, and I can't speak anymore. All right. Have a good weekend, guys.